You're listening to episode 150 of the Tennis Files podcast with special guest Greg Lesur. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Tennis Files podcast. My name is Mirban Aranshad and on the show I interview the world's top coaches, pros, and experts to help you improve your tennis game. And today I'm really excited to bring you an interview with my friend Greg Lesur. And he is a master instructor at Online Tennis Instruction, which is one of the most premier online instructional tennis websites out there. And not only that, Greg also competed at an extremely high level, even actually earning an ATP Tour point as well. And he has coached, I think, thousands at this point of players in person and through online instruction for sure at uh, Online Tennis Instruction and really helped them improve their game. And through getting to know Greg, And in having him be on my tennis summits the past couple of years, I have come to learn and and have confirmed that he really has a great knowledge about the game, and he is a true student of the game, even though he's an instructor and helping teach a lot of great players out there and, you know, amateur players, all types of players really uh, level up their game, which is what we're all about here at Tennis Files as well. And uh, so we talk about... Uh, volley technique, serve technique, uh, the fundamentals to, to becoming a better tennis player, and specifically to this with the serve. Um, there's obviously a lot of mechanics that go on in there, and so it's really particularly fun to dive into tips on on that, and and also just really how do we hit more efficient volleys. I know a lot of players are scared. <laughs> To put it mildly, when they're up at net, and so this episode will definitely help alleviate that and give you a path forward for improving those areas of your game. But uh, not only that, we delve into a lot of different areas as well, uh, the mental game, and even Greg's journey from his you know beginnings of of playing tennis up to his his journey and playing really high level tournaments with some of the best players in the world. Uh, and even some coaching tips too for you coaches out there. So yeah, it'll be a, a really fun episode. And like I said, Greg is definitely a very impressive coach, and he really had a fantastic session for this year's tennis summit, which is on was on serve returns. And so I thought I'd uh, change it up a bit for this one and have him talk about volleys and serves, and also just to uh, let you know, as, as we have done in the past couple uh, episodes. We actually recorded this interview live last week, and it was really fun. We got some great questions. We went for a while, and you know, immediately after, we got a ton of really great emails from all of you. So I want to personally thank each and every one of you who sent me emails uh, about how much you enjoyed this uh, this live session. And so whether you're listening to it again for a second time, which I highly encourage because you know it's. It's really important to, to nail down these topics in your head, uh, whether that or uh, if you're listening to it for the first time uh, via the podcast, I hope you really enjoy it. So without further ado, here is my interview with Coach Greg Lesur. Hey, everybody. This is Mirabon Aranshad. I'm here with my friend Greg Lesur uh, from Online Tennis Instruction. And uh, if you can hear us, then say hello in the chat. And I'm going to check the YouTube page, which usually it, it'll start up right away. Uh, looks good. Sweet. Well, it looks like we have, yeah, like about 90 or so of you in the beginning. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you on, Greg. I have had uh, Greg on uh, a couple of my summits, and it's really exciting to have him on the podcast because I can tell you that we have definitely enjoyed our pre-chats, if you will, uh, before our, our, you know, the, we, we have Greg on the summit. Uh, we, we kind of plan out the content and it's always been a pleasure. So Greg, first off, uh, how are you doing today? How's everything going? Yeah, I'm urban, doing good. I uh, had a good day today and uh, you're ready for the weekend. And uh, it was always good to chat with you. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this. It's always interesting and make it fun. So thank you for having me on. Thanks a lot, Greg. Really appreciate that. And um, when we were talking a couple of days ago, I think I was curious about just in general how you were doing and how your students were doing. And it was very encouraging for me to hear that uh, quite a few of your students have been very 
passionate and have been still improving and, and, and trying to improve their games in the face of COVID. So I wanted to ask you, um, well, what kind of, kinds of things have your students actually been doing uh, to improve uh, during the t these times, especially when we can't get on the court, or at least a lot of us can't? Yeah, you know, we, we've actually put together a couple of uh, live training calls or tra training classes. And, um, you know, we focused on making you know, technical improvements to the game, you know, at home, we can do a lot of shadow swings where you take the kind of the, the stress out of it, you can slow things down. And also we included some fitness in that as well, which has actually benefited me. <laughs> it's got me off my lazy, uh, you know what, and uh, got me working out again. So, um, yeah, so we, you know, we, we had a, a course, we structured a course on serve and return. So we covered those two aspects. And Nadim uh, Nasser, he's my fellow um, instructor with OTI. We did that together. And then we relaunched a kick serve course. And we did some at home training with that. And now we're in the middle of a, a volley course. Uh, so we have like seven live training calls. And uh, some people can make it on court. So we do have some um, training things they can do with ball machines or with a certain practice partner. Um, but it's, uh, no, it's been, it's been great. I mean, I think. The feedback we had from some people is that it's been the highlight of their uh, quarantine. So, uh, you know, I, I, I said that's what they've said. So, um, but we've certainly enjoyed it. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's kept people active. And, um, you know, we had great interaction um, with our students and in the chat. So, um, yeah, it's been a real, real good uh, couple of weeks considering what's going on. Yeah, that's really great, Greg. And uh, it's just really fantastic to hear the impact that you have had. And, you know, I'm sure many other coaches who are trying to provide value to their students have had. And I, I remember uh, during the summit, I received a couple emails from people who actually had COVID and they said that, it, you know, it was really nice to have content to help them improve. And so part of that was your great uh, serve return session, which was fantastic. So, I mean, I, I was really excited for that. I mean, it's, it's a subject that people don't actually really uh, focus on enough. And, you know, just maybe uh, you don't have to recap the whole thing, but I mean, what were a couple principles that, that are really most important that we need to keep in mind when we're uh, trying to improve our, our serve return? Yeah. You know, I think the, the biggest thing is to first realize that, you know, it's not your normal ground stroke that you're hitting. It's, it's a, actually, it's a very, it's a, it's a slight variation of that. Um, and I think uh, for me personally, I didn't know that <laughs> while I was playing, I figured it out afterwards. Um, and, you know, on the serve return, there's a certain kind of footwork you want to use. And maybe I should backtrack real quick. You know, you, you have a re all the way back, back and you treat it more stroke or you you know more like a, like an Andy Murray a Djokovic um, Federer com, um, Ferrer comes to mind where you uh, are stepping forward and being a lot more aggressive standing tight to the baseline that's kind of what we focused on um, so there are specific footwork um, patterns you want to um, to use where you know you time your split step appropriately when your opponent's striking the ball um, some players if you know if you watch Djokovic he actually just starts like with his feet um, like this, he splits forward and mm -hmm. then he will, you know, um, take, get his outside foot lined up with incoming ball. You know, Federer is interesting on the first serve. He does what Djokovic does on the second, second serve. He then steps forward and splits. That's something we see with like, uh, Murray and, and Dave Ferrer did that. So, you know, you get forward momentum. And then the idea is you want to try to line up, uh, the outside foot and the hands together with the incoming ball. Because what happens is you lose the ball when it's like eight feet from you. So you want to line up because you can't, re can't really see the ball anymore. It becomes a blur. So once you line up, then you're going to try to step through with body momentum, very much like a volley. And the, the take back is much more abbreviated. So you know, instead of a full turn we talk about in ground stroke, it's more like a half turn so that your strings, and I always tell, tell my students, think of your strings angled slightly forward. You know, it's not all the way to the side fence. You can't really see me. Let me move my camera. <laughs> Feel <laughs> so it's, it's uh, you know not all the way the side fence. It's a little bit angled forward like this. I can't really come out of the out of the picture there. So it's uh, abbreviated turn, and I think the hitting sensation is a lot different. You know, ground strokes more like a brushing, very circular motion, where on a return it's more like that pushing sensation through contact, and um, it's a little more linear. There's a small little circle, but it's a little more linear and upwards with more extension. So 
But to summarize all that for you, um, you know, it's a uh, your footwork's a little bit different where you're moving through most of the time. Ground strokes, you kind of grounded. You want to be grounded. And then your 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 take back is a little more abbreviated and you have more of a diagonal like linear path than a circular lifting motion with a normal ground stroke. So those are kind of the key things that we uh, try to help people with. Love it, Greg. Yeah, I really appreciate that because, you know, a lot of times we, we wonder, you know, why are we we very inconsistent with our serve returns? And a lot of times it's, you know, we're just swings are too big, footwork's incorrect. And so uh, that's why I really, again, uh, it enjoyed your session there. And think about, you, you know, you mentioned that you didn't even know about, uh, you know, the proper serve return technique until later. Imagine, you know, we'll talk about this later, your journey, uh, you know, in competitive tennis ranks. And, you know, you've you've achieved, uh, you know, you've earned an ATP point uh, and gotten ranked as well, uh, which is not easy. You know, it's a dream for many of us, uh, but Greg has achieved it. So that's wonderful. As far as, you know, your players uh, who have been trying to improve in the face of COVID, I was wondering to, um, you know, the kind of, uh, and I don't know how much you get involved in their, their total training program, but uh, how much did they do of fitness versus um, like, you know, swing oriented, uh, orientated things and shadow swings and such. Yeah. So I'll just take you through a little bit on like how our, our calls have been structured. You know, we usually, uh, you know, send them, send out the, the, the training we're going to do the day before. And then we allow them to ask questions before we start the training for about 10, 15 minutes. And then we're spending, you know, probably anywhere between say 20 to 30 minutes on technical training where it could be shadow swings, you know, working the body, working the swing. Um, and then we spend about 20 minutes on fitness. So there's probably a little bit more on the technical side. And then we, we, we wrap it up with some fitness. It's all like tennis specific uh, things. I mean, I, I'm not a, a fitness uh, uh, expert, but certainly uh, I've done a lot of fitness in my day. And it was a it was a kind of a hobby of mine. I would uh, study a lot of books and 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 uh, had some background in it. So, so we just try to um, imp- choose things that could could help them with their tennis. That's wonderful. Yeah, and we we talked uh, as well. You know how you had studied uh, Mike Boyle, who is uh, who was on the Tennis Files podcast as well, which is great. Uh, and yeah, it's always really important to be a student of the game and immerse yourself in tennis and, you know, seek out great information from sites like, uh, online tennis instruction as well. Uh, and so we'll obviously have a link for, uh, you to visit, uh, you know, in the show notes and such. Um, as far as volleys, I want to ask you, um, Greg, you know, of course, like volleys are feared by a lot of people We're we're afraid of going to the net or getting hit by the ball. So I'm curious, <laughs> if, you know, I, I was too. It, sometimes I am. It depends who I play. I'm sure if I played. Not oh, that Greg, hard. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm get those huge 300 square inch rackets to protect myself. Uh, <laughs> but in, in all your years of, um, of coaching and, you know, playing, obviously, what is maybe one main problem area that you see in, uh, in that players have with the volley. Yeah, bro, but I say, I think the, the number one thing I see is players swing too much. They do way too much with the swing on the volley. And, you know, it stems from, I think from one of two things. I know from myself, I didn't really understand that there was much of a difference between a ground stroke and a volley. So you'd have two distinct swing patterns. You know, your ground strokes are more of a circular lifting motion where volleys are more of a pushing linear motion. And, um, you know, I had the, the, the privilege to actually um, hire Raven Claassen as my coach when I was uh, playing after college and playing on futures. And uh, when we worked on my volleys, he said, Greg, <laughs> you're swinging way too, way too much, my friend. <laughs> Shorten things up and just, you know, he said, just think of it as a pushing motion and try to flatten it out. So, um, you know, I learned quickly that I didn't have to swing that much because I was getting the pace from my opponent. But also, you know, most people will will kind of step too early or if at all. <laughs> so they've lost body momentum. So when you're volleying, there are two sources of powers, the power from the incoming ball from your opponent, but also the power of your body momentum through the shot. So if you step too early, you've lost one of those um, power sources. So then you have to make up for it, and that's where people end up taking too big a swing. 
So, you know, those are kind of the two things I see which are kind of interrelated. Understanding that it's it's different to a ground stroke. It's a completely different sensation through your hand at contact. And you want to do less and do more with your legs. Yeah, use your body momentum. And, if, you know, volleyers love pace because if you volley effectively, you're just reflecting the pace back to your opponent. Awesome. How do you get that that step timing? Because I, you know, I've I've uh, also experienced that myself, where you know you incorrectly uh, step at the wrong time, and you're using more of your arms now uh, instead of the momentum. So, I mean, what what types of drills or things should we be doing to to practice that? Yeah. So I think you know the first thing is to make sure you have a, a compact take back, because if your take back's too far back, you know your your arms are always going to lag your feet. So you know I I kind of would tell you know, you know, from a technical standpoint, you want the racket, the hand to stay in front of your shoulder. So even if you turn, that's okay, but you don't want it to go beyond your shoulder. And, you know, it's interesting, you know, I worked for a guy, um, Steve Smith, who I um, spent a lot of time with and really helped me to become a, a, a tennis teacher. And he'd always say, you know, you, you cut your own hair, getting back to our haircuts, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Because um, what happens is when you lose um, the visual acuity of your hand or racket, you don't really know where in space it is. So now I don't know if my racket hand's here or if it's way back there. So something that I often tell players is that when you set up for your volley, try to see the tip of your racket out of the corner of your eye. So if I'm looking at the ball coming in, out of the corner of my eye, I'm seeing that the tip of the racket. And I want to try and keep it there at all times. Now, it is an over-exaggeration, but anytime you make technical changes, you have to over-exaggerate the movement. So that's number one, is making sure you're not taking a massive take back. And then what I find helps is to delay the inside leg stepping through. It's almost like you're going to the ball first with the swing or with the hand. So you're going towards it, it's like you're falling into the court. So you're gonna contact the ball, then the foot will follow. And then that helps you to get the timing. So it's thinking about going with the hands first and then let the, let the foot follow. That's very interesting um, because it, it, you know, it seems like with other strokes, like with the uh, serve and ground strokes, um, and you, you know, can correct me if I am thinking about this incorrectly, but um, it seems like you're kind of leading with your lower body. But in this case, I, I definitely see how like leading with with the, you know, the upper, like, uh, allows for the, the weight shift. Yeah, um, actually, you're 100% right because, you know, your power always comes from the ground up, so you're actually pushing with your outside leg. So, you know, if, if these are my feet and I'm hitting a forehand, I'm, I'm mirrored. <laughs> it's kind of weird. <laughs> this is not going to go so well. Um, okay. So, so basically, um, I think that's better. No? <laughs> You're putting your outside leg. So if you're right-handed on your forehand volley, you're getting your right leg behind the ball. And then you're going to actually push with that right leg, which will then get your body moving forward with the swing. And you're just going to let the left leg lag a little bit. And that will help you with the timing. Gotcha. Cool, Greg. Cool. <laughs> Thanks for that uh, tip there. And I'm, I'm hearing some uh, some rain. It could thunderstorm. So clearly I uh, picked a great time for the stream. No, but I, I think we'll be fine. We have got strong internet. Um, thanks, Verizon. They're not sponsoring the show. Uh, <laughs> as long as um, we don't have Florida Florida lightning here. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, that's even worse, I think. Um, so we did get a question on, on Facebook uh, from Paul. And he, you know, it's kind of a, you know, maybe a basic one, but still very important. Uh, how important, in your opinion, is the split step? Because um, he's even heard from certain people that it's not really that vital. So I was wondering, you know, your thoughts on the split step. You know, I think there's there's different times. And we're talking about split step when the, when you transition to the net and then when you're at the net. So I think they're two different mm -hmm. things. Yeah. And, you know, when you're transitioning to the net, um, you know, funny enough, I, I was uh, very fortunate um, to attend one of Vic Braden's uh, last tennis universities. And, you know, he, 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 he was just so amazing. You know, at eight years old, you know, he was still learning and still, um, you know, f following the game. And, and improving as, as, as he went along. And you know, he said one of the biggest mistakes he made was to teach people to split step when they didn't need to. So in other words, you know, if you're coming in from the baseline, let's say the situation where you're forced to the open court, your opponent's stretched, and you just want to get as close to the net as you can. In that situation, you don't really need to split because the ball's floating. You're not going to fall over if you change the direction. You can actually just run and then just change the direction um, towards the towards the ball. So in that situation, you don't actually have to split. 
because you lose time going forward. Now, the other time you're going to do a different split is if you are serving and volleying or you're hitting an approach shot and you're taking what I call a transition split where it's more these stutter steps. So you're not just kind of splitting like this, you're kind of stuttering and that's allowing you to kind of you know, gain your balance and then move in the direction of the ball. Now, when you establish your position up at the net and ideally you want to be around about midway between the net and the service line, um, I'm probably half a step back from there. And I call that a neutral position. Because from that position, you can go close to the net to offense to finish, or you can go back to the service line to defense to hit overheads, to cover lobs. But in a neutral position, you're generally going to split. And the split step, the timing is a little bit different where you know, on a ground stroke, you're going to be at the height of your split when your opponent's hitting. Where on a volley, I mean, you, you're going to be on your way down. You may even be touching. Now, why that's vital is when you split step, you are pre-stretching the muscles in your calves and your Achilles tendons. So now it becomes like an elastic band. So, you know, as soon as you, you land, it's like you're landing, but you're immediately able to take off. But if you're starting in like a static position, now you've got to recruit muscle to, to now make that move. So from that understanding the science, I would say, you know, the split step most of the time is, is, is important. But I will say, um, just thinking back to when I'm playing, and, you know, I'm a, I'm a net junkie. I like to be up at the net. <laughs> you know, if somebody's setting up, you know, with a big forehand or an overhead, I find that then I'm, I'm actually a little bit grounded. I'm just looking to react. I have my racket out here and I'm probably not making a split. I'm just trying to trying to react. So, again, you know, it's just different scenarios. Uh, you know, I think that's one thing with tennis. You know, we get all these discussions about stances and this and that. And I think you've got to play all kinds of stances and it all just depends on the situation. And the position you're in. So again, it comes back to the split step. You know, the times you you, you definitely want to split, times you don't want to split, <laughs> times you want to do the transition, and other times you got to hold to try to just kind of react and rely on your reflexes. Love it. Appreciate that, Greg. Uh, great information as always. So um, in regards to the grip, I mean, of course, we've all heard continental, continental. Um, is there a, a range of uh, grips that are acceptable for volleys? And you can also answer this in the the inverse, which is uh, what grips should we not be using? So either way. Yeah, you know, this is a this could be an interesting uh, topic here. Um, you know, I think there's there's two, two schools of thought in, in coaching. You have the one grip system, Continental, and then you have the minority, which is like a two grip system where you make a slight change from forehand to backhand. Now, I'm in the second camp. Um, I never used to be, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I had some really uh, reputable players um, who actually ha make grip changes and they, you know, playing on the tour, uh, you know, and, and doing very well. And the reason it comes, and, and, I'll, and I'll give different options, but the reason you got to be careful of just one grip is when uh, <laughs> I'll get you I, in here. Get me in here. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> so, so when you hold a continental grip on the on the forehand side, those strings actually point forty five degrees away from your target. So. You know, if you're like Johnny Mac and you're able to lay your wrist back and maybe contact the ball a little bit later, now you can square your racket out. So now your strings go to your target, right? Now, if you're not able to make the adjustment, then you may need to make a slight change to like a 2.5. Like, you know, this is the top panel here. It's kind of like that ridge between um, grip one and grip two. So you would kind of be, um, sorry, grip two and three three i i mixed up with the camera here right. so you're going to be like a 2.5 it's kind of it was called an australian grip because back in the day you know the, the aussies in the 60s 70s called it us a hybrid um but then that's not very good for a back and volley because again the strings are going to point the wrong way and you're going to put yourself in a very weak wrist position mm -hmm. so then you want to be close to that grip too so you can see there can be a very minimal change but again, if you can be on two and just make an adjustment with your wrist, then you can get away with one grip. And that's what I did when I played. Um, now, um, when it comes down to the continental, it's very interesting because before I got involved with OTI, I was um, primarily working with juniors and going to tournaments almost every weekend. And it was interesting to see most players, they had one grip, but they weren't on a continental. They were actually on a 2.5 mm. like this. So they all had really good foreign volleys, but the back end volley was really weak. So, you know, I think um, it's, it's interesting. A lot of people think they have a continental, but a lot of times they're favoring a forehand and now the, the backhand will suffer. So um, 
the last thing about grips is that every time you change bevels, it changes the angle of the racket face by 45 degrees. Every bevel, the eight bevels. So it's massive. So, you know, things you should avoid, um, you know, I would say, you know, volleying with your ground stroke grips, um, you know, where you're on a strong three, a grip four, we see that, we actually do see that. Um, so those things you, you should try to avoid. But for, for our listeners out there, you know, find a grip that, you uh, um, you know, if you prefer one grip, try to find a grip that, that you could be in a strong wrist position on your back end, which will be a two. And the four, and you lay your wrist back a little bit, adjust the contact so you can square the racket out to, to your uh, target. If you're very strong in the forehand, most likely you're going to be weak on the back end. Then you need to consider possibly making a change from one to the other. And, you know, the, the argument is that there's not enough time. But, you know, even in the ITF book for coaching, um, the, the argument is there is time for it. The problem is, is that if you don't train for it, you just you won't have the time. It's a motor program, just like anything else. Um, so, so yeah, it's a, <laughs> as I say, it is an interesting topic, and some people are very um, you believe strongly in one or the other. I mean, I, I certainly see there's there's room for both, but at the end of the day, you want to try and get the strings going to out to your target um, as, uh, as as much as possible. Yeah, thanks a lot for that, Greg. And, you know, I, I have experience with what you were talking about because I um, did for a very long time have a strong forehand volley grip. And so I, I found that my backhand volleys were quite weak, actually. And so I had to kind of shift around the grip to accommodate. Uh, so and that went on for a little while. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I really appreciate <clears throat> appreciate that. And yeah, wow, the rain is coming down. Can you hear it? <laughs> In the mic? I can't. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have a good mic, I think. Um, Great. Well, uh, you know, you mentioned actually being under Raven Clausen's tutelage, which, I, as we all know, really fantastic player and your countryman, I believe. So uh, what lessons did you learn? And I know you I know you mentioned a couple, but maybe, you know, outside of even technique, it could be mental or, or training or anything else that you learned from Raven. Yeah, you know, um he really surprised me, you know, when, when I, when I got done with college, I went back to South Africa and started playing futures and he was the only other guy in you know, a city of 3 million people trying to do the same thing. And he was a far and is a far better tennis player than I'll ever be. He was about 300 in the world. And, you know, we, we were trained together and then, um, you know, he had some injuries and I was coming off a couple of bad losses in, in Asia and I called him up and said, hey, Raven, um, I need help with tactics. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and uh, it was very interesting. It really kind of made me sit down. He said, well, Greg, he said, in order to, to execute tactics, you need technique. Yeah. You need the technical skills to execute it. And, you know, my whole life, I mean, I had really nice, aesthetically pleasing strokes. They looked good. But uh, definitely I had some technical issues that were preventing me from executing certain tactics. So, um Funny enough, we, we started working on, particularly on my backhand, my one-handed backhand, working on something I'd never heard of, an inside-out swing path. <laughs> uh, we talk about an inside-out target, but actually the swing path, and golfers understand this, should go away from the body as it goes forward and upwards. So uh, we spent a lot of time on that. I was confused a lot because I thought my one-handed backhand had to be something like this, like the reverse of my forehand. And... Um, yeah, we spent uh, hours and hours and hours and hours <laughs> with him dropping balls in the alley for me. He was sitting in the chair because he couldn't stand and just trying to get the ball to rotate with true topspin. Very few people hit that. And it wasn't about flipping the wrist. It was just kind of keeping my arm relatively straight, lifting from the shoulder and swinging inside out. So we, we spent so much time on that. And then he really helped me with uh, my understanding of my biggest downfall, which is impatience on the court. <laughs> you know, um, my whole life I'd heard, you know, Greg, hit the ball really hard, but you are impatient. <laughs> but that's a very general statement. And, you know, he was able to really help me identify which shots I should go after and be aggressive on and which ones I should just rally or just defend on and where where to defend. And to be totally honest, you know, I, I went through juniors, I played played you know, college, division two college. And, um, you know, you just basically told me, you know, Greg, when the ball's deep, don't change direction. Okay, I, was, I don't know, maybe I heard it, but I didn't hear it. <laughs> it's 
but I, I thought I'd never heard that before. And you said, wait for the ball that's short, where you can get inside the court, be set up. Then you can go to the open court. Then you can change direction. And, you know, hearing it was one thing, but it, it was definitely, it was just like an aha moment. But then it took a lot of practice <laughs> to unlearn that because, you know, it's so instinctive, you know, just like technique, uh, your tactics are also these habits we've created. And, you know, if you look at, you know, the, you know, the greatest game ever played, Federer and Adele, there's an interview in there where they say it happens so quickly. I mean, you have like less than one and a half seconds to decide. It's almost like a reaction. And you're going to react, make the same decision each time. So we had to go back and do a lot of, we call situational drills, where I had to you know, wait for the right ball and train myself to, to make the right decision. So those were like the, the main things that we focused on. Then we cleaned out the volleys and we, we worked quite a bit on my kick serve. Um, and then overall, it just helped my, my tennis IQ, understanding high percentage tennis, something I had no idea about. I, I, I thought tennis was hit the ball as hard as you could to the open court, <laughs> which, yeah, if the ball's short and you're in position, yeah, that works. But if you're not in position, <laughs> you know, that court's not open. So yeah, that's kind of a, like in a nutshell. Um, I guess other things too. I mean, we worked really hard on my fitness. I mean, I never, I've never been in better shape in my life. He got me hooked up with a, a really good sports psychologist, um, Clinton Goldweiler in South Africa, just to how to cope with things on the court. You know, so um, yeah, I, I guess we kind of did an overall <laughs> overhaul. <laughs> but um, but those are kind of like the main points. Without getting into too much detail. <laughs> oh man, I have a lot that I can unpack from that. So, oh yeah, we, we um, could go on. I mean, I yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll, 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 you know, take kind of take a uh, uh, a listener question, which is you know along what I came to mind for me, which is um, regarding the the shot selection. And you did mention you know change of direction. Obviously, one of the hardest uh, balls you know to to try and whack, but. Uh, what are some other instances of, of shots where you, you shouldn't, you know, go for, for broke on or that it's unsafe to, you know, hit too aggressively? Yeah, so, um, okay, I'll stick to ground strokes and then I'll move on to volleys. But, you know, if you if you out wide defending, you know, you, you, you don't really want to go down the line because number one is your body is moving. You've got momentum going this way. And if you're trying to go down the line, you've got this angle deflection you've got to overcome. The ball wants to go out. Um, and so, so it's almost like, you know, you're throwing something out of a moving car. You know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to move forward as well as sideways. So the, you're going to miss most of those balls wide. Also, if you don't hit the ball well enough, you've left the entire court open. So, you know, if you don't get your feet set, I mean, you should be going cross court. This is singles, you know, most of the time. If you're not balanced, you're not set. Also, you know, I found out that when you are behind the baseline and out wide, you should you should play more centered through the court because you eliminate the angle that you give your opponent. If you are behind the baseline and you hit an angle, you know, tennis geometry, an angle equals an angle. You hit an angle, you give an angle. So now if you're too far back, you hit an angle, your opponent is stepping inside the baseline in offensive position with now an angle that they can hurt you with. I just learned that from trial and error. Every time I hit an angle from behind the baseline, I lost the point. Mm. Um, now, when it comes down to you know approaching the net, um, and you know, we can see these examples in the pro tour, this is something that Djokovic has improved on tremendously. That's understanding your short ball range. And basically, it's understanding that from the time you hit your approach shot, you have about you have enough time um, – by one and a half seconds to get to the net, which is about seven steps. So if you go back and look at Djokovic, you know, a decade ago, he would hit a ball from the baseline and try to come in and get stuck on the service line. The problem with that is you've given his opponent too many angles and he would keep getting passed. Now, if you watch him, he's waiting for another shot where the ball's shorter, generally stand, landing inside the service line, where he's, where he's inside the baseline by a couple of feet. So now he's taking time away, but he's hitting it from a position closer to the net. So now those seven steps translates to him getting to that neutral position we talked about, midway between the net and the service line. And if you position yourself right, you, know, you, you eliminate the angle, giving your opponent between one to four degrees to hit a passing shot. 
So suddenly your, your success rate goes way up. But it's just understanding that I've got to wait for a ball that's short enough where I'm inside the court. Mm-hmm. I've got to move through it, most importantly, so I can get to good position for the first volley. So on the approach shot, waiting for the, the, sh- the ball that's short enough. Now I put the net, and this is a common one, you know, understanding when it's a defensive volley and when it's an offensive volley. You know, volleys below the net or too far back, you generally don't change direction. Hmm. You, you say you hold the line. Uh, the reason is because when you hold the line, you are in a better position for the next shot. If you hit, if you hit a defensive shot to the open court, you actually have to now shift over to the other side because at the net, you have to position yourself in the same half of the court covering down the line. So, you know, if you hit like a, a low volley cross court, you've got to now shift all the way to the other side. So now your momentum is moving one way, plus the ball sitting up, your opponent's inside the court. They can go either behind you or, or if you don't cover it, they can go, um, go down the line. So understanding when the ball is low or it's defensive, go back at your opponent. When you hit to the open court, you want to be getting into an offensive position close to the net with the balls above the net where you can really stick the ball to the opening. So if they do get there, it's going to be a weaker shot and you can put it away. So, you know, those kind of like just like basics with court geometry, but, um, you know, it, it makes a world of difference. I think a, a lot of times what happened to me, I got to the net thinking I had to end it right away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Get to the net with the understanding, hey, I might have to hit two, three, four volleys if I have to. And just, you know, play the percentages, hit one ball back deep. And if you can hit one ball back deep where it came from, your chances of, of, of winning, the next, winning the point go drastically up. So there's just a couple of things there. Uh, hopefully uh, you could follow me in, on all those. <laughs> just a couple <laughs> really valuable things. Appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> love it. And so you mentioned something uh, very interesting that I want to unpack a bit, which is that Raven said that, you know, you, you need to have the technique before you can implement the tactics and in the bigger picture, the strategies. So, but then you do have another camp that says that, you know, you don't so much need to focus on technique and, you know, just, uh, try to implement the strategies and all that. So I was wondering, you know, how do we um, combine those together? I mean, it, you know, is is are you firmly in the camp of what Raven is saying? Because it doesn't make sense, right? That if you want to be able to execute a strategy, but you can't actually hit the shot, then you can't do it. So especially thinking about, you know, the amateur player, um, wh- which one should we be concentrating more on first, if we can even determine that? <laughs> Well, you know, the thing is, what happens is, um, you know, and, and tennis is a lifetime sport. You know, we have a, you know, an ITF circuit for the 90s and over. And, you know, sh- certainly we get into the game, we, we, we just want to play, play, play. And I, and I totally get that. But then what happens is, I just got an email from a lady uh, who's in our volley challenge saying, you know, she was winning tournaments, but she's plateaued because uh, she didn't have the right fundamentals. So what happens is you get to a certain point where you can beat everybody at your 3 or 3 5 level. The problem is when you go up the next level, you don't have the, the skills to hang with the next level. So you've, you've placed a ceiling on your improvement. So, you know, that's when, you know, the, the technical skills become important. And at the end of the day, you know, the most important thing is your point of contact. Hmm. So, you know, it doesn't really matter what you do. We just say be more efficient because of time. But it's, you know, what are your strings doing, you know, before contact, at contact and after contact? Now, most players will play, you know, play from the elbow or the wrist and they play across their body. When I do this, I have to be like pinpoint accurate because if I hit the ball late, it's, you know, I'm missing wide. If I hit it early, I'm missing wide as well. Or very often I'm rolling into the net. But if I'm able to kind of play from my shoulder joint and lift like the pros do, um, I need to move. (laughs) This is throwing me off this mirror. But if I lift from my shoulder, my strings go out to the target for a long time. So now I can play the ball a little bit late, on time, and early. Hmm. So now I'm able to redirect that ball and most importantly have consistency in performance day in, day out. Because if I have to be exact, I mean, just a bad night's sleep, you know, just a tough day at the office, you're going to be off on your timing. So you want to really lengthen the hitting zone. Um, and that's, to me, if you look at pros, that's one of the things that differentiate their strokes is that they just have the longest hitting zone. So, you know, they can go from, you know, uh, the French Open onto, you know, the grass court circuit and they can adjust because, you know, the ball is, they can adjust to different speeds much quicker than most of us. So definitely um, 
I'm in the camp of, you know, you got to have the technical skills to execute strategy. But understand, you know, from a recreational level, we want to play. So you just got to try to balance those things. And at the end of the day, you know, the, the, the more efficient you can make your strokes, the better. The less you do, the better, the, 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 the less complex the structure. Love it. Thanks for that, Greg. I want to get to uh, a, an audience question uh, um, regarding volleys. Um, so wrist or no wrist on the volleys from Michael? Yeah, I would say no wrist. You want to kind of be firm, not tight, but firm, because anytime you start to break your wrist, just imagine this is the ball coming at you and you're breaking your wrist. See how I'm, 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 I'm basically, my racket's moving out of the path of the ball. So it comes back to timing. So if I mistime it, you know, I'm in trouble, but if I time it perfectly, I'm going to be okay. But if you, know, if you drop the wrist here, you, you just, um, it's, it's too much to time. And in actual fact, you know, a lot of people are told to add underspin to the volley to help get the ball in, keep the ball low. If you time that correctly, it works. I mean, you, you, can, you, know, you can get the ball low and all that, but you have to be perfect. But in actual fact, you know, if you hit the ball a little bit flatter, and that's when you watch, when you play against Raven, his ball moves like this to you. <laughs> I mean, you can't even hit, hit the ball back from the baseline. It's easy for you because you have a long hitting zone. Okay. So like the long hitting zone here and the flatter ball skids and stays low. Now, you know, the question is, well, the ball's not going to go in. Well, you know, the, the research tells us if you stand on the service line, hit the ball at 70 miles an hour on a straight line, a foot above the net, four feet high, the ball will go in because of, because of gravity. Um, the Bryan brothers, when they did tests on them, could only max out at 53 miles an hour. So if you just send the ball in a straight line, provide your racket's not open, gravity will take over and that ball will go in. So, so I know that was a long answer, but that's kind of the rationale behind it. You just want to eliminate things that cause excessive timing. Cause you know, I use my wrist this way, whoops, or this way, you can see how it makes it very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Really much harder to hit solid volleys. Um, appreciate that there. Um, yeah, no, just by the way, I mean, I, I keep <laughs> mentioning Raven, but it was really cool to see him and Michael Venus last year at the city open, uh, which is my hometown tournament. They, won that one. I, I think it was against Roger and Takao. So really cool. And last question, I promise uh, <laughs> regarding that, but you know, you mentioned that you had really upped your fitness level um, while under, uh, you know, the training with him. And I was wondering besides the intensity of your training, which sounds like it went up quite a bit for fitness, was there anything else you changed, you know, as far as your approach to fitness as well at that time, or even any other time that you found very helpful? Um, you know, um, what was, what, what was interesting is maybe a little bit away from your question. Yeah. We, we'd worked a lot on my back end, for instance. And, you know, one of the things you said to me, you said, well, Greg, you know, <laughs> it's hard to have, run you around and have you work on your back end. So we have to work on your back end, but then train your footwork independently. And then we marry the two. So, you know, at the end of our practices, Every day, I started with 15 minutes of court sprints, different kinds of sprints. By the end of it, I was doing 45 minutes a day, court sprints on the court. So I slowly like upped that. Um, you know, I think my whole life just changed. I mean, I was just different commitment level. You know, it was tennis from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, you know, part of that was taking naps, <laughs> you know, eating, um, driving, but pretty much I dedicated that time um, you know, six days a week. Um, but I would say one of the things that also made a massive difference, um, was actually a guy I was met playing in France, Ladisha Glatze. He played, play, he's from Georgia, the country of Georgia. And I had this old leather r jump rope and he's like, oh, Greg, man, you gotta throw the thing away. <laughs> it's making you slow. You see, man, you need to be like a boxer. And he, and he gave me this, uh, this, this little, you know, you gotta get him a warm off for three bucks speed rope. And I started doing that and I started doing, you know, I've worked, started with five minutes, worked up to 15 minutes every morning of speed rope um, where you go as fast as you can. <laughs> but what it does is it improves your foot to ground contact. And that's really a measure of your speed. You know, how, how much time is your foot in contact with the ground? So if I'm in contact with the ground for a long time, hence the leather rope, mm. I'm slow. But if I'm in contact with a short amount of time, I have this quick fast twitch muscles going, I'm going to be much faster. So I started doing that and it was amazing. Probably a, 
probably about four, five, six weeks into it, I suddenly just felt on the court like I was just moving differently. My feet were just, I mean, I just couldn't stop moving them. It was just, it was just there. I didn't have to think wow. about it. And that's something I always tell my students. I'm like, you know, if you look at the best players in the world, three things in common. They jump rope, they hit the backboard, and hit tons and tons of serves. And, you know, what's the common denominator there? Yeah. You don't need anyone else. You do it by yeah. yourself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So those yeah. are the things I always tell people. But, uh, yeah, I mean, those. And then, you know, just getting in the gym, two a days, using the exercise bike. But I would say those those things probably made the biggest difference. Fantastic. I really appreciate that reminder about, you know, training your fast twitch uh, muscle fibers. I mean, cause I, you know, I even a couple of weeks ago, I saw somebody who said, you know, it's time to train hard for, uh, for my tennis game. And then they said, you know, here's my routine. And they had like a, you know, a seven mile run. And I said, no, no, why are you doing that? <laughs> so, uh, it's not the quite, quite the right training for that. Yeah. Um, so Greg, uh, as far as the serve, just a couple of questions about the serve and we'll try to get to some, uh, audience questions too, but a similar question to the volley, which is um, if you had to pick one part of the serve or maybe even a couple of parts, if you like, that you have found throughout all of your coaching of uh, many, many thousands of players probably by now uh, that they commonly have uh, issues with what part of or parts of that stroke would it be? Yeah, Mervyn. Um- you know, it's interesting when you, you know, it comes down to the serve, you know, you, there, there are four, four aspects to it. I mean, you got the grip, you have the swing, you have the body, and you have the toss. But just kind of overall, you know, looking at, at, the, at the arm action, you know, that's where you actually generate the most power, although everything's involved from the ground up, you know, the body and so forth. But, you know, I, I don't know how many serve we reviewed online. I mean, it's, it's in the thousands. And people have worked with in live instruction, you know, where people really, which way I've got to move here, <laughs> where, where people really lose it is the beginning. Um, and, you know, it's so counterintuitive because with the serve, the only time your string is going to point, you know, at the ball is literally at the last second as you swing up and pronate. <laughs> Other than that, your strings are, are, are pointing away from the ball. And I think it's really hard to get your head around that. It just doesn't make sense. And, you know, when we start playing tennis, it's easy. Just toss the ball up and tap it in. And that's, you know, that's an approach I don't want it. So, um, you know, we start to advance our serve, but it's still in there. It's still programmed. So I think that what I find, if we can get players to, what we say, begin the serve right, we talk about our right to left, where the racket moves, you know, from the right side of your body over your head. Notice how the strings are angled slightly down. Yeah, it's better for your shoulder. It keeps your shoulder looser. And it drops behind your back to the left. That sets you up to what we call the racket drop, where the racket points all the way down is aligned with the right side of the body. All right? And really, it comes from that racket drop comes from being loose. We're starting, all, starting the right to left correctly, excuse me, being loose and then driving your legs. But I find this is what gets people. Because what happens is most people will turn the palm up, get in this open racket face. So now... If everyone just tries this at home, it tightens your shoulder. Oh, hurts. And exactly. So it could lead to, lead to injury. Plus, it makes it very difficult to you know, supinate and you know, externally rotate to be you know, real technical. Um, it makes it difficult to do that. And maybe I've seen one person who could do this and get the racket drop. Um, I don't know what it did to their shoulder, but most people cannot optimize it. Um, so they either do this or... They, they, they swing their arms back, they go out and around. Now the racket comes in this way <laughs> and then they lose the ability to, to drop the racket. So I find that, you know, the, one, that's probably one of the biggest things I see. Um, if you can get the racket moving from right to left and then just relax and let the racket fall as far as your arm action goes, you know, that kind of sets, sets you down the, the road to developing a good serve. And then, you know, just, and then also the understanding that I have, at the last second, that's when I'm going to pronate. Um, I mean, that's probably the most common thing. I mean, we can get into other things about ball toss, grips, and, 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 and people opening up too early. But as far as the arm action goes, I would say that's probably the, the part that if people could work on, it's that beginning, that right to left. Make it simple. Go slow in the beginning. Just bend from the elbow. Let it bring, it, bring it over your head slightly, should I say. <laughs> 
and just let it drop behind your back. Love it. Thanks a lot for that. That's fantastic, Greg. Um, so I see a couple questions here. I apologize. I have to go in reverse this because I want to keep it on the serve first with Jay's sure. question. Then I'll go back to Gary's. Um, but so uh, uh, Jay says or asks, how do you get more pace on a kick serve besides let the ball drop, stay more sideways, swing along the baseline or toss in the baseline? Any other tips or progressions? Thanks. Yeah, Jay. Um, yeah, that's that's a good question. Yeah, I think a lot of times people hit a kick serve. It's more of an American twist where they 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 toss the ball too far back behind them and they arch their back. So now you don't get any body rotation. Number one, it's not good for you for your back or your shoulder, but you don't get a, a lot of body rotation. And plus, the ball's behind you. So you know when it comes to the kick serve, the understanding that it, it's like your your regular serve with some adaptations. So you're still going to have, you know, that racket drop, but um, you you want to make sure your body's turning rather than arching. So, you know, you're going to get the, the uncoiling from the ground up. So it's going to help you with power. Now, when you are learning the kick serve, your toss, we say it's kind of more in line with your head, but still slightly in front. So it's not behind you and it's not too far to the left if you're right-handed. But as you get more and more proficient at swinging, you know, up and out, you can start to get the toss further into the court. Now, the problem is, is that if we do that too early on, then people end up over rotating too much. And then they end up almost hitting more of a slice because the, the swing goes into the court. So you all want to make sure that you're tossing in the right place. So it's, it's in line with your head slightly in front. Make sure you're rotating your body, not arching. Um, you know, provide you have a good racket drop. Once you can do all those things, you want to toss further into the court, but still stay sideways. Because when you're further into the court, and, and you can do this when we get off the court, you can take your racket and, and, and swing fast, and the swish is going to happen in front of you. So if you contact the ball behind you, your racket's not, not, not fully accelerated when you're hitting the ball. So you hit the ball, ball's gone, the acceleration happens after, afterwards, and it's not translated into the hit. So, you know, those are the things I, I would look at. And the other thing to keep in mind, you know, if you look at, you know, the speed, comparing a first serve on the men's tour to a second serve, a first serve on the ladies' tour to a second serve, on average is about a 20 mile an hour difference. So, you know, if you're serving at one, if you're serving at you know, average 115, you're at 95. If you're serving 100, your average is 80. Now, if you're working on your serve, you can imagine that that, um, disparity is going to be much greater until you know you get proficient with the second serve then you start to get more pace in it but you are going to have a lot less pace on that second serve love it thanks for that greg's dropping knowledge bombs here um <laughs> <laughs> i appreciate it hope it's not too much <laughs> no no it's great i mean and yeah that's a great point you know for everybody watching is to obviously you know when you're listening try to figure out okay what one or two points, uh, you know, that I want to focus on and then uh, black out some time to, to train that. So, um, so let's see, my friend Victor here asks, um, so my best and most consistent serve on the do side is out wide. So should I go T or body say 50% of the time regardless? Um, you know, it all depends on your opponent. And I think as you go up levels, your opponent will start to pick up tendencies um, you know, and they start to lean one way and they maybe even start to cheat over a little bit. So, you know, I always think of it more like a game of cat and mouse. I grew up playing cricket. You know, you got a bowler, you got a batsman, you got a pitcher, you got a hitter in baseball, and you're trying to keep them guessing. So if you have one serve, you know, once you get to a good opponent, they're going to pick up on that. And if you, if you got that good wide serve to the deuce court, my, my, um, assumption is, is that you probably struggle hit down the tee so then your opponent can stand all the way over to the right and then they can pretty much pick up all your serves so i would say you know i would work on being able to hit the ball down the tee because that way you can spread your opponent where he cannot guess so what you do is you pull him out wide you get him leaning that way now he leaves you an opening now you can you know bang it down the tee now he doesn't know where to stand now now you're playing this constant game of cat and mouse so i would say you want to be able to hit that you know, that flat a T serve and the wide serve. But at the same time, you know, the body serve, it's, it's so underutilized, especially especially in, in, in club tennis. You know, most players don't know how to get out of the way. So, you know, if your opponent is swinging out um, 
offensively, you want to jam and go right at them. But just to summarize, I would I would try to be able to hit you know both corners, and that way you have options, and then you can kind of mess with your opponents. You know, and that's kind of where the fun is. You're trying to get them guessing one way or the other, and you may be able to pull some more aces out the bag. There you go. Yeah, and this is gonna be a weird example, not related to tennis, but as you can probably tell, I'm a huge nerd, and so uh, you know, on rare occasions when I'm not working on tennis files or my normal work or whatever exercising i play you know a game or two and uh my friends pointed out that hey you you know you keep getting uh beaten up i guess well fragged as they say because you're in the same spot so the opponent just knows oh he's there i'm, I'm just gonna you know get him right there so you really have to vary your positioning and and uh you know i think that's a, a big and fun way to to play the game to keep your yep. opponents guessing like you said uh greg so appreciate that so uh the question from Gary, which was not related to, uh, to serve so much, uh, is <laughs> this could be a long one, actually. I don't know. <laughs> what is your best advice for hitting a drop volley forehand and backhand? So is, wanna, is that one stroke or is that three different ones? <laughs> that is the newest stroke in tennis. Uh, if you didn't know, Greg, no, I'm kidding. So let, <laughs> let's take the drop volley. What, what do you think yeah. about the drop volley? Yeah, you know. If you want to see a great drop volley, a drop shot, you know, Rafa Nadal, um, you know, less is more. I think a lot of times we try to cut the ball way too much. We try to do way too much with the ball. And that was something your know, Raven helped me with. He just said, you got to absorb. And, you know, on, on, on a drop volley, that's a dro drop volley, right? Yeah. Um, you actually want to step into the shot, but you want to soften your hands and, and you actually – the racket kicks back a little bit and you bring the elbow into your body like this. You're taking pace off and you're absorbing the pace. And just by making this movement, it'll actually put a little bit of backspin on the ball. And, you know, I find the drop volley, it's, got, it's going to be a little bit lower. It's hard to hit a drop volley that's too high. So it's a little bit below the net level. And you're probably going to, you want to step into it. I find you have more stability. You're going to land before contact and then just kind of soften those hands and like bring the racket into your body here and try to absorb the pace. The same would be true on the backhand side. So I'm going to bring the racket into my body and just kind of soften. See how the, the racket kind of will kick back a little bit. You're absorbing the pace of the ball. That movement there will give the spin you need. Um, yeah, so that's kind of my best advice on the on the drop volley. But if you can start to do that, uh, it becomes so effective because you you really in, in any time and you want to you rely less on time the shot perfectly. And you want to go with a, a you know a, a, a method. I'm gonna say a method, but you want to go with the one that requires the less amount of calculation. Got it. Thanks, Greg. So I do want to talk a bit more about your competitive tennis career as well. And so um, I guess when was it in your career that you felt like you wanted to and maybe I don't know, maybe it's possible you didn't even think about it really as a, a long term goal. But if so, when in your career did you feel like you wanted to become a professional tennis player and it became like your your number one goal? You know, I think it started for me. <laughs> young kid <laughs> okay nice you know it's just you know everyone has a dream you know my dream was to was to play at Wimbledon you know be amongst the best um to to be a professional um you know that was my dream and um yeah so it started from an early age um you know looking back I don't think I realized the amount of work that went into it <laughs> yeah it's maybe why I'm not a professional but but yeah from an early age yeah gotcha gotcha and uh, when you w transitioned to the pro tour, what were like the the most difficult aspects of uh, being a professional tennis player um, for you? Yeah. So firstly, just a, a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a disclaimer there. I don't consider myself to be a great player. I mean, I was a decent player. You know, I played on the future circuit. Um, uh, you know, I didn't. Uh, uh, I, I didn't. I didn't make headlines or anything like that. But I think in the process, it, it really helped me become, you know, a better tennis teacher. Yeah. You know, I had this curious mind, and you know, I, I think I said in the call with you, Mervyn, yesterday is I, I can tell you how not to do things. <laughs> um, so a little disclaimer on that. I, I don't want to make myself to sound any better than I am. But um, I think you know what was interesting was, um, I think it was managing expectations my, my own expectations and also maybe like taking it almost too seriously 
hmm. where, you know, after college, I was playing my best tennis ever because I, I didn't care. I mean, I mean, I cared, but I, I just played free. The moment I said, hey, I'm going to go do this thing. I'm going to go play futures. I got tight. Because hmm. suddenly it was like, okay, I got to win. I got to win. I got to win. <laughs> and I lost, 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 lost um, kind of a, uh, the vision, you know, lost the lost the the process, and mm-hmm. and maybe just going out there and just trying to you know enjoy it a little bit more. I became almost a little too serious, and that was one thing when I stopped playing. Almost wished I had you know taken a couple of weeks away from the game early on, and 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 just took a, a, a look across the street and said, you know, I'm in this tennis bubble, and. Yeah, if I want to lose a match, the only people are really going to care, you know, it's my family and my close friends. <laughs> I mean, when you think about all the terrible things happening in this world, I mean, if I want to lose that match, I mean, come on, I mean, it's not going to make a difference to 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 world peace and to people's lives. Okay. And I think if I had that kind of outlook, that hey, you know, yeah, it's important for me, I want to win this match, but at the end of the day, you know, it's like you, you can't win everything. I would have played a lot more relaxed. I think that's really where I struggle the most. I, I put a lot, too much pressure on myself to, to to like win everything, and you you can't play when you when you're playing tight. So I think putting things in perspective um, was probably the most difficult thing. Yeah, no, for sure, it's definitely not a pressure, and uh, it's it's not an easy skill to be able to put all that aside. You know, when your livelihood depends <laughs> on uh, a tournament win or a match win. So. Um, a great question from Karthik uh, that's it's very related. Um, and this could be, you know, your mental routine perhaps now or, you know, one that you would build for somebody. But um, Karthik asks, what is Greg's version of uh, mental routine and how did you get the impatient aspect away from your game? Okay, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think one thing too is, 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 is breathing, you know, uh, taking deep breaths, trying to control your breathing. Uh, Florian's big on like meditation. Uh, I got yeah. a kid working with the USTA. They're doing a lot of breathing exercises. You want to control that. Um, you know, and that kind of builds into your routine. Um, you know, I, I worked with a with a sports psychologist, but it was just gave me tools. You know, I would say understanding what you cannot can and cannot control. So understanding your opponent's bad calls, if your opponent has a funky game and you think that they cannot play tennis, well, hey, you know, they figured something out, you know, <laughs> you know pushers are one of them. We, we, we give them a lot of a lot of flack, but I mean, they might masterminds, they understand how to play the game. So, you know, don't, don't, don't uh, discount them. Um, but what you focus on things you can control, things you cannot control, you got to let them just slide off like a water for duck, ducks back. Um, I think that was a big one, but when it comes to routine, you know, I've, I've kind of followed Dr. Jim, Jim Lear. He has a 16 second cure. You know, if you go on YouTube and just put in 16 second cure, I mean, you'll have probably hundred coaches that are out there presenting it. And, you know, what I like about it is number one, when you're playing tennis, 80 to 90% of the time, you're between points. So you're right here. How much time do you really spend working here? We spend all the time hitting forwards and backhands. We're right here. So it's what you tell yourself between points is so critical. Also, you have all these things coming through your mind, like me. Oh my gosh, what is I if I lose this game and I, I should be winning six love? Now it's you know four three. What's going on? <laughs> you're gonna have those thoughts, you're gonna have those doubts, you're gonna be thinking, you know, you know, what ifs. But if you have a routine, it distracts your mind. Okay, so right now you're probably not hearing anything around you, but if there was air conditioning going on, I'd say, hey, "Can you hear the air conditioning?" <laughs> now you're hearing it. And I'm gonna tell you now. I don't. I want you to stop hearing it. You can't block it. So by having a routine, it it, it helps distract you from those distractions. Now, when you do the routine, everybody's great when things are going well, but when things really go badly, that's when they throw it out the window, and that's what you need it the most. So we look at Nadell. He takes two extra seconds between points when he loses a point on average. Mm. Okay, so getting back to Jim Lea, he has f- four parts to the to the, um, the the between point routine, and they they last four seconds. Okay, the first one is uh, as a positive action response. So you know you, when you look at the court, you look at someone playing, you don't really want to know if they've lost the point. I mean, maybe you can't tell they won or lost, but you definitely want to try to be positive. And there's a whole physiological reasons for that. If you lose the point, 
you know, you simply just turn away from it. If you, 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 you missed the easiest fall in the world. I mean, I've done it. So, Merban, I'm sure you've missed the easiest fall in the world. No, no never. <laughs> never? Oh, really? Yeah, I, have. I mean, you're in denial. First thing is accept <laughs> awareness and acceptance. <laughs> Fine. And commitment to these routines. That's right. um, so, yeah, you, you've got to kind of try and act positive. I mean, Maria Sharapova, she would slap her leg. That was a high negative. She would get the negative out. Mm. Get it out. Then you want to go into your relaxation, your breathing. You'll see, you know, players will put the rack in the non-hitting hand, look down their strings, breathing, move around the court. They're relaxing. Then you want to start to plan. And I've added evaluate because believe it or not, I would win a set, sit down, stand up and not know how I won the previous set. <laughs> I mean, I just played instinctual until, you know, I had the training I had. Um, so you evaluate, you know, the point not without overthinking. Okay, hey, I got a short ball. What? Did I, oh, I hit, hit to the back end. They gave me a short ball. Okay, I can I can get short balls that way. Or, you know, um, my opponent is being really aggressive, returning my serve. Maybe I need to serve at their body. So you start to evaluate what's going on, but it kind of helps to remind you what you need to be doing, and then you plan for the next point. So so evaluate and plan. So it's okay, I'm going to you know, hit my serve here and I'm expecting to get this shot. So I like the one you know, wide and gliding. I'm going to serve out wide. If I get a short ball, I'm hitting to the open court. You know, I'm going to serve down the tee and I'm going to come and serve in volley, for instance. So you, you're planning what you're going to do next. Surprisingly, a lot of people, you ask them, where are you hitting the serve? And they go, in. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big tennis bo service box. <laughs> so have a plan and then you want to have your ritual. And your ritual is a way of your mind you're dealing with stress. It's it's a safety mechanism. Your body knows it. It's something you do every time. Nadell is notorious for that. But it kind of it kind of gets you back into kind of your comfort zone. But also, it um it's it's a way to tell your brain it's time to focus. Because you know tennis match is going to go on from forty five minutes to three hours. You cannot focus for that amount of time. So during the point, you want to be a high state of focus, and then. Between points, you're going to do your routines, but you kind of lower that focus a little bit, so you're relaxing, but then you got to turn it back on, and your ritual will help you with that. So, but if you just check it out on YouTube, you'll you'll see variations of that. But it's you know positive relaxation. You know, I've said evaluate and plan, and then ritual. Love it. Thanks so much for that, Greg. And we'll definitely link to uh, to the four stage uh, process that that uh, Jim Lear, Lear uh, describes, and that you've eloquently said as well. Uh, appreciate that. So as far as, uh, coaching, so, you know, I know that you've learned a lot. You, you, you said that you've read a lot of books as well. Since you've started coaching, is there any sort of, um, philosophy technique approach, anything that you have kind of changed your mind on, um, you know, since, uh, starting to, to coach? Yeah. Um, good question. Let me think about that. Um, sure. You know, I would say before I, you know, you know, I never, I never planned on being a coach or being a teacher. Um, you know, because, you know, I, and, and I worked with coaches who, who really cared, but I just felt like they, there wasn't like a, like fundamentals. There wasn't like a reason how, or why it was, you know, do this, but you know, how do you do it? And it was once I started working with Rave and then suddenly I realized, Hey, you know, there is a methodology out there you know there, there are certain fundamentals and you know it was really through you know i don't know anyone certainly english speaking world other than vic, vic, than vic braden who's done this kind of research who's been able to break down the fundamentals and um you know i would say that my a lot of that was formed before i got into teaching because i had the exposure from raven so I mean, Raven gave me such a good base understanding of that. Um, so when I so when I chose to get into tennis teaching is because I felt like, you know, I, I'd gone a long time not really knowing these things. And my mom, she played nine Wimbledon's and she taught tennis after that. And she was always looking for answers. And she 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 taught me, but she, she at the same time she knew she didn't know. And she was always looking. So between her and I, <laughs> you add all those years together, suddenly, you know, you come down to something, hey, this makes sense. So um, that's kind of why I chose to teach. And, you know, I've kind of followed that. And, you know, Vic has, you can go back to his earlier books, but he's definitely, if you, if you have all, I've got some 
some DVDs that not everybody has. I mean, he's definitely moved with the game. I mean, looking at Federer and Adele, I mean, he's got all kinds of stuff out there. So um, I guess the biggest thing that's changed, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I think it's, you know, there's a lot of it is to do with uh, biomechanics, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I, I was very lucky as a kid to work with a biomechanist and I forgot all those principles. And then when I went out on my own, I started remembering those things mm-hmm. and I started putting it together with my understanding of technique. And the two kind of work together. So I would say, um, yeah, the biomechanics have been very interesting to me, um, you know, how you use the body. So I think that's, and it, it goes across sports, golf, boxing, kicking, whatever it is, baseball. So, yeah. So now it's not quite maybe a direct answer, but. <laughs> no, no, that's perfect. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, it's always evolving, you know, what we're learning and the biomechanics and uh, just, yeah, flexibility, all that. So, uh, which is really fun. Um, as far as getting involved with uh, online tennis instruction and, and, and Florian, I mean, I'm curious as to, you know, because you're one of the, you know, the top coaches there that that is really putting forth great information, which we really appreciate. So how did you get involved with online tennis instruction? Yeah, you know, it was a um, very interesting story. I'll be quick. Actually, Florian and I kind of missed each other at Steve's, so we spent some time there, but we never met each other there. It was really through a, a student of mine, an adult student who, um, you know, basically he would come see me every three to four months. I would film him, show him the video, make videos for him, and then give him drills to go work on it. And, uh, you know, he, he actually was an early subscriber to OTI. And he kept talking to me about Florian. I'm like, yeah, I've heard of Florian, but I don't know him. <laughs> anyway, he, he ended up in Germany. Um, this guy, um, Aaron, he's, he was my, my student or is my student. And um, he went over to Germany. He took a lesson with Florian. And it was just, uh, you know, over lunch, uh, they got done with the lesson. And I guess they started talking about OTI and came out that Florian was looking for, you know, to add coaches to his, to his, um, to his staff, I guess. And that's where, this, where Aaron said, hey, well, this is guy Greg down in Clearwater. And, you know, he, he films me and he pretty much told me some of the things you told me. You should probably look him up. <laughs> So I got an email from Florian and uh, he was coming over to Miami later in the year. So I met out there with him and we did a clinic together and it's kind of, that was the beginning. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool, uh, Greg. I was curious about that myself. It's just <laughs> <so> that, <laughs> That's very good to know. And, uh, oh, so Steve has a question here. Steven, excuse me. Oh, yeah, the Steve. Uh, yeah. How, how do you keep honing in on your teaching skills? Has your club started giving lessons in Florida? So there's a few questions here. When you're not traveling for clinics, what level of player do you work with? So feel free to answer. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, Steve, good to see you on here. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, we are constantly evolving. Um, you know, it's, it's probably, it's more kind of taking what, what you've learned and then you just kind of adding to that. Um, you know, I was talking about the biomechanics, you know, just like, um, you know, just, 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 it, it's, it's always looking to get better. I mean, I think Florian really was the first one to help me understand, you know, the, the lag on the forehand, often called the ATP forehand. Um, and actually, maybe that's the one that really changed, I changed on. <laughs> there we mm-hmm. go. Uh, but, but I knew it was there, but it's so difficult to teach it right because most people will use the wrist incorrectly. They do this and they lose the hitting zone. So I, I stayed away from it. But Florian really broke it down to me to a level that I fully understood it and able to teach it. So, you know, I think we learn it from each other, learn from watching. I learn from playing, but also learn from, you know, watching other coaches. And um, I think you can learn something from everyone. Um, I mean, even like a coach that would totally disagree with me on on teaching technique, um, I've learned so much from that coach, <laughs> how to implement what I do and add what he does so well. Um, so I think this, and, and, and being on the court all the time, you know, you're constantly trying to find the right key for the right keyhole that will help players. And you start to find things that work for more players than not. You know, and then it also got a little bit into understanding how you learn, you know, picking up on keywords. I feel that, I hear you. Oh, I see that. It tells you how people learn. 
So it's just kind of trying to improve you know, your own listening skills to get through to how those people learn. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just a constant, you constantly trying to improve, you know, look at the pros, that's what they're doing. They're pushing the games to the boundaries of the game and we, we constantly learning from them. Uh, so the other questions are a few more. <laughs> yeah. Is, uh, has your club started giving lessons in Florida? And then when you're not traveling for clinics, what yep. level of player do you work with? Yeah. So our club, um, where I, where I operate out of, I mean, they, they're open right now. Uh, you know, people have open play They are giving some lessons. Um, you know, we are, we're not too, too badly affected, fortunately. So, you know, things are a little bit more open. Uh, when I'm home teaching, cl- uh, not teaching clinics, I used to teach about 20 hours a week um, here. And uh, about a year ago, I had to cut that down because it was just too much. So, you know, I was working from anywhere from a three or three, five um, lady to a, a three, five gentleman to a guy who's five, 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 five. I work with still, still today. Uh, some high level juniors um, uh, in the academy. We've had some kids that have been ranked top 100 ITFs. Um, you've got a guy comes through, he's about 500 in the world. Um, so I, I just work across a range of different players. And, you know, I think I learn from every kind of player, every level. But the most important thing for me is to be on the court with somebody who wants to improve and wants to learn. Um, and that's what I enjoy, you know, being on the court with people who want to get better. Love it. Awesome, Greg. And yeah, I definitely want to respect your time here. So I know you have a, a very important workout with a very <laughs> important person. Uh, right. <laughs> so uh, let's see. You got a couple more, I guess. But uh, feel free to let me know, Greg, when you need to leave. So uh, Christopher, uh, so I think you know, says my yeah. tenant high point was taking lessons from both Vic Braden and Greg Lesur. Vic taught me the fundamentals and Greg internalized them. Many, many thanks. So that's great. <laughs> Chris, thank you so much. Great to see you on here. <laughs> yeah, that's great to see you there. Uh, Jay So, sorry if I mispronounce. Any clinics in the works in Boston? Is the Toronto clinic still on? Yeah, right now we don't have anything scheduled for Boston. I, I think the, the the difficulty is just finding a venue who will let us come teach. Um, you know, that's that's the I put, that's the biggest challenge. You know, I think when we step on there with the iPads and we break things down. You know, sometimes people aren't, get, aren't happy with us. <laughs> You know, coaches can be territorial, so that's one of the, yeah. the toughest, toughest things is to find a place that will let us teach. Um, but if we have one in Boston, we'll definitely be there. Right now, Toronto. That's all going to depend on if any travel restrictions. Also, we're constantly monitoring, you know, the safety factor. So right now, they are on, but we'll make a decision. Uh, I think um, early July, whether or not we'll still put those on. Thank you. Good stuff, Greg. So a couple more questions for you. So you mentioned that you you read a lot and we did discuss, I think, one book, although that might have been in our previous chat. But <laughs> if you could gift three books to a friend to help them improve their game, which three books, and they don't have to be tennis books, but which three books would you uh, gift to that friend to help them improve? Yeah, you know, I think uh, a book that sort of everyone should read in tennis and a, I mean, I'm I'm am a nerd, so maybe I, I like this too. But it's it's Vic Braden. Uh, it's updated tennis 2000. I uh, don't be thrown off by the pictures. <laughs> Unfortunately, like they're kind of outdated, but uh, the information there is, you know, the game has evolved, but the fundamentals are the fundamentals. So Vic Braden tennis 2000. I think the end of game of tennis uh, that was a great book. You know, I think I'm going to stick with tennis books right now. <laughs> That's cool. um, and and also Brad Gilbert's Winning Ugly. Yeah, I think that was also a fantastic book. Um, you know, I'm sure there are others out there, but uh, my mind's kind of screwed onto tennis. <laughs> but yeah, I would I would recommend those three. Love it, awesome. This is usually a fun one for our guests, and this thought provoking. At least I'd like to think so, at oh. least. <laughs> so, uh, if you could uh, erect a huge billboard in the most highly trafficked area uh, in your hometown. Uh, and you could write anything that you wanted on it. Uh, it could be about anything, really. Uh, what would you uh, have written on that billboard? Wow. <laughs> no, I got this. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Um, you know, it's maybe a little bit deep, but I would say, you know, life's all about moments. Hmm. You know, and I would say, you know, just really make the most of the time you have with the time with the people that you're around. 
and create good, happy memories because, you know, time flies by, but you can always have those great memories and great moments. So I don't know if it fit on the, it fit on the billboard, but, you know, really make the most of your time and, and, you know, make the best of your moments, make great moments. Yeah, I love it. So, Greg, uh, I just want to ask you, too, about, um, you know, different projects, like what's, what is going on currently at uh, Online Tennis Instruction? And I know you mentioned, like, there's a volley challenge, too. So uh, what, what's going on that we could maybe check out at, uh, at Online Tennis Instruction? Yeah, so, you know, currently we're running a 14-day volley challenge. So, you know, we're doing some live uh, classroom calls or group calls. So it's kind of integrated with, a, like, a static um online course, but then we are supplementing it with online training. And it's a really neat uh, format. I, I really enjoy it because you have this interaction and you kind of get your students' reactions. <laughs> you know, when you put out a video, you don't know how people are, are taking it in, if they're taking it at all, if they hate it or they love it. <laughs> but you really, you know, you, you get, um, it's a different feel. And, and, and also, you know, you find out that maybe you didn't quite get your point across Sometimes I talk too much. So my, my wife told me not to <laughs> today. Um, but you, you can really make sure that people's understanding is there. Because if you understand something, I think then you can remember it. It's not just remembering. It's about understanding, seeing the full picture. Um, then you can go to work. So, um, yeah, so the, the, the live calls have been fun. I mean, we've taken questions. Um, I've enjoyed being put on the spot. You know, people ask me some some tough ones. <laughs> Sometimes I never thought about them before, but it gets me thinking and it tests your you know your your depth and and your breadth of knowledge. Um, so yeah, we're doing a lot of the 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 challenges lately. Uh, we we ha we haven't been able to do clinics just because of what's going on, but I would say Florian's done an excellent job. Certainly, you know, supporting us coaches, giving us opportunity to do um, more more live, more interactive, more innovative live things. I think um, we're probably going to start to get into more of a cor uh, courses with more sort of online, like live training bonuses possibly. Cool. And then um, we assess the situation. We may start to look ahead and where we can start to do clinics. Love it. Great to hear. And, uh, you know, we mentioned obviously online tennis instruction.com uh, anywhere else that the audience can go to, uh, to connect with uh, you or anybody else uh, that you'd like to mention. Yeah, so um, your first thing, you know, if you go to our site, there is a, you go on the homepage, you can click on there to get some free videos on your serve. So you can check that out. But if you go to YouTube and you just put an online tennis instruction, you can put Nadim's name, uh, Nadim Nasser, Ian Meyer, uh, you put myself, Greg Lucier, Florian Meyer, and uh, you know, you'll just see a ton of stuff come up. I will warn you though, because then you'll start seeing uh, Florian serving on his knees. <laughs> you'll see our ads popping up. But uh, if you just put it, just go onto YouTube and and, and input our, our our name, and you you should find us. And there's plenty of stuff out there. You know, we did this uh, this this crazy offer last year, offering free video reviews. And I don't know how many came in, but we we're able to pretty much instruct people with all our free videos on YouTube. We could look at the reviews and then find the video on YouTube that's free. It's out there and, and give them those links. So there's everything and everything, anything and everything, but, uh, you know, you just want to make sure that you pick one thing and kind of stick with that for a while. Love it. Love it. And yeah. And Rick says, hi, Greg, hoping you will put a clinic here in Toronto, which yes, I know <laughs> mentioned about, which is great. Uh, let's see. Um, oh yes. So, all right, maybe I can sneak this in. We'll see. But I know you yep. need a dynamic warm up in for your your workout. So that's oh, that's right. I mean, I I I can hang for a while as long okay. as you know, long as people are on board yet and <laughs> yeah, once yeah. it's got to shut up on this side, you know. <laughs> no, no, no. We're 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 enjoying it, man. I appreciate it. So Jack uh, is asking uh, for a reflex volley where the ball will be blasted at you. Do you guess and put your racket on one side, hoping to get it back? You know, Jack, it's a very good question for me personally. I don't even know what I think. <laughs> um, you know, what I do find is it starts to happen. Like I, I'm basically setting up and, you know, I don't think I split step. I think I kind of dig my heels in a little bit because all I'm trying to do is I'm trying to line my strings with the incoming ball, my racket with the incoming ball, and somehow I'd able to direct it right, like normally back to where it came from because it's so hard to change direction on that. Um I have found myself for some reason, and you know, I'm 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 a sucker when someone's hitting hitting an overhead. I don't back up 
find myself using my left hand as a crutch <laughs> on the right. back. And I, and I, I kind of reflex a lot like this, but sometimes it's behind me. It's like this. Um, a lot of it comes from, you know, as a kid, we just played a ton of mini tennis where, you know, we just messed around. Anytime there was a, you know, a little spot where you could play tennis, we were just playing, you know, like these continental games with, with touch and you're playing all kinds of imaginary shots and making them up. And it's just about trying to be aware of where your rack and strings are. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm probably just really trying to read my opponent and, yeah, I don't really have a an exact formula. I do have drills that you can work on that with, where uh, you know we we play really hard and fast games, and your reflex will improve. But yeah, I'm not quite sure what I think to be honest. Yeah, no, I mean that was, that was a good answer there. Um, so I, I end the show with this question, which and you've given us uh, many key points, but <laughs> I'd like to ask you, um, what is one key tip that you can give our audience to really help them? Uh, improve their tennis games uh, and and level up. Yeah, um, one key tip. You know, I th- I think firstly, you know, you really got to love love what you're doing. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's a great um, documentary, Raising Greatness. Mm-hmm. It's on Amazon Prime, and it's got Pele, and you've got Wayne Gretzky and Jerry Rice, and it comes back to I just watched a, a movie on. Um, uh, Pantani, the cyclist, sadly, mm. he, he died of a, a drug overdose. But, you know, if you look at all these, these greats, you know, they just, I mean, Pete Sampras, he had a rack in his hand all the time. And they, they were just, that's all they did. <laughs> you know, they just, they just wanted to be around it all the time. So you really got to lo- lo- love the game. Um, you know, and as far as improving, you know, you want, if you really want to simplify things, you know, I think sometimes I can be guilty of making it complicated, <laughs> but but really, you want to simplify it. You want to just basically give yourself the longest hitting zone, where um, you 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 have a big win to hit the ball into. And I would say, if you really want to improve your game, one of the best things you can do is is actually hit the backboard in a very productive way. Um, you know, 15 minutes is like an hour. All of us are very busy. Um, so if you can just find maybe even once a week, go out there and just kind of work on a few things, you hit in the backboard effectively. Um, I think that will do wonders for your game. Awesome, Greg. Well, uh, I really appreciate you coming on. And uh, I want to say, you know, even though we have a combined over six months of no haircut, uh, you know, we'll, we're going to make it. <laughs> 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 but uh Greg, make it. Uh, <laughs> I had to like gel my sides back and <laughs> I know no actually yeah, I had to I put pulled up my hair yet. behind my ears you know it was like popping out you got it, it man you know yeah. it. <laughs> it's, it's a tough time but but yeah no, I, I definitely feel fortunate you know to one uh you know still be healthy and two to be able to talk to uh somebody uh, with as much expertise and uh you know also um you know being as friendly as yourself Greg so thanks a lot for coming on to the podcast and everybody Definitely you want to check out online tennis instruction.com and go on the YouTube channel as well for the same name, online tennis instruction and check out Greg's videos uh, and uh, Florian's and everybody's of course uh, on the channel. So uh, Greg, thanks a lot for coming on to the podcast and looking forward to talking with you again uh, very soon, hopefully. Great. Murban. It's been fun as always. And yeah, I look forward to uh, chatting again sometime. Thanks again. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. (laughs) Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks for the great questions. All right. I really hope you enjoyed my interview with Greg and really appreciate it, Greg, for coming on to the show. And like I said, really enjoy uh, chatting with you, uh, whether it's on an actual piece of content or otherwise. And so uh, looking forward to connecting again soon. And thanks to Online Tennis Instruction as well for the great content. And uh, Florian and Nadim and everyone out there uh, doing a great job with that content. Uh, and speaking of appreciation, I would also appreciate it if you would uh, leave a rating for the Tennis Files podcast, and you can do that on your favorite podcast app of choice, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, etc., Spotify as well. Uh, I do find that it's a little more impactful on Apple Podcasts, but uh, yeah, I'd appreciate it you know, regardless of the app that you use. And that would help in a couple of ways. It would help uh, the visibility of the show and it would help 
uh, thereby reach more people because it would push the show up the rankings. And, you know, that's the main point of what I'm doing is to help spread uh, what I learn and what I can extract from these great experts, uh, pros, coaches, uh, etc., from the show um, to you all. And so uh, to spread that to as many people as possible is the goal. So I definitely would appreciate a rating for the show and also want to uh, leave you with a quote, as I often love to do at the end of the show. And this one is by Paul J. Meyer. And Paul said, productivity is never an accident. It is always the result of a commitment to excellence, intelligent planning, and focused effort. Uh, Three really great elements here. I mean, you have the commitment to excellence. So Whenever you're faced with any temptations or anything uh, that'll provide you with short-term pleasure, you always have to remember your commitment to practice, your commitment to getting better, your commitment to reaching the point in your career that you want to reach and beyond. The intelligent planning, as Alan Lakin has said, failing to plan is planning to fail. So you definitely need to plan out your practice sessions, your tournaments, um, your fitness, etc., and uh, your focused effort, obviously, uh, you can you can even go as so far as to show up to what it is you you need to do. Again, you know maybe that's your practice or your workout sessions. But if you're not focused on your effort, then it's just going to be a waste of time. Really, you can't half a things, as you probably know the the last two letters of that a uh, letter. <laughs> but yeah, that's how you become productive, and that's how you accomplish your goals with. Commitment to excellence, intelligent planning, and focused effort. Thank you, Paul J. Meyer. Probably the deepest I've gone in explaining a quote. But yeah, really hope that you're all staying safe out there. And, you know, with especially with the courts opening up in some areas. Uh, again, you know, it's uh, even though uh, it's really pleasing to see uh, one of my friends and, and colleagues, Kristen, she actually sent me an article that uh, rated 36 different activities and uh, one is the lowest and it listed tennis uh, as one. And, you know, I'm not uh, an expert on uh, diseases or anything like that. I'm just citing, you know, one article from some uh, science-based experts on it. But yeah, it's just good to see that tennis is on the lower end of the risk spectrum, which I think is a universally agreed upon thought there. Uh, so yeah, be safe and enjoy your tennis if you're able to play. It was really cool to see that finally the sign that said do not play in so many words from uh, that was on the courts nearest to me has been eradicated and taken away, which, you know, is exciting. And yeah, actually the other day, I think actually yesterday uh, from the time of recording this, outro uh i actually went out and just kicked off a couple uh three teenagers because they were skateboarding on the tennis courts and you know it's they're young and they don't realize the impacts but clearly i mean first off there's a huge sign that said no skateboarding no pets my dad actually a few weeks ago had to kick out or maybe months ago by now had to kick out someone for having their dog on the court and uh you know it's not because we're trying to assert some sort of weird, you know, power or whatever. It's just simply because these activities ruin the court. So I highly encourage you all to protect your courts. And uh, I posted about this on my Instagram story as well. But uh, if you see somebody doing something that's harmful to, you know, in any capacity really, but I mean, especially, well, not especially, but if you see them on the courts and they're skateboarding or doing something that will clearly mess up the courts and just go out and say something be respectful you don't have to chase them you know with a stick or something as i actually read about that someone had done which is crazy but uh just let them know hey you know there's a sign out there and if you use this uh the skateboard or have this pen on here it's going to mess up the courts it's going to result in higher costs to the community and so uh yeah just do it man because i used to see that type of thing go on and just be in my shell and either just convince myself to wait until they left or, you know, just ultimately to not say anything. And uh, it doesn't really feel good. It just feels better to take action and uh, let people know that, you know, about the negative impacts of their actions. So yes, I have blabbered on 
for sure. And I appreciate you, you know, the five people or so who are still listening at this point. <laughs> um, uh, I just wish you all the best and, uh, you know, keep trying to improve every single day. It's always a struggle. It's never easy. You know, there's plenty of days where I wake up and I don't want to do what I need to do. I feel lazy. I start to divert my attention to other things, but you just have to keep fighting the good fight and you know, try your best to commit to excellence. So, all right. All the best to you all. We'll see you again next week as we do every week. And this is Mirban signing out. Mm-hmm.